Thank you, Kelly. And uh, welcome to our e-briefing on spending in retirement and financial shocks. Um, my name is Lori Lucas, and I'm the president and CEO of eBrief. And as Kelly indicated, we have a very large crowd today. We reached our attendance capacity for today's e-briefing about a week ago. And it's little wonder. How people spend their hard-saved money in retirement is a critically important topic and maybe one where there are many misconceptions. And as I was thinking about this webinar today, I, I hearkened back to the movie from 1979. You may remember uh, Steve Martin's movie, The Jerk in which he and his wife were about to lose all of their worldly possessions. And his wife turned to him and said, you know, it's not the money, it's the stuff. And we will actually be um, challenging that assumption, at least about retirees, in some of the analysis you'll hear today. Um, we'll, we'll find that retirees maybe are not as into the stuff um, and are more into preserving their money. And this is uh, interesting given that life cycle theory suggests that workers accumulate assets during their white, uh, working lives um, and intend to spend those assets during retirement. In fact, most retirement models and much of the advice provided to retirees are based on this assumption. Um, so we are going to look at do uh, retirees really want to spend down their assets or are there other dynamics at play that may keep them from doing so? We will hear uh, both from uh, the qualitative side and the quantitative side in terms of research that has recently been done, and I'm very delighted with the experts we bring to you today. On the quantitative side, we'll hear from Sudipto Banerjee, a former research associate at EBRI who is now a senior, management, a senior manager of thought leadership, retirement, and financial education at Hero Price. Sudipto will explore analyses he conducted while at EBRI using data from the health and retirement study that shows actual spending patterns among retirees. He'll also delve into a critically important factor when it comes to spending in retirement, which is the likelihood that a retiree, a retiree will receive an enormous shock in the form of out-of-pocket health care costs. On the qualitative side, we'll hear from Anna Rapoport, Chair of the Society of Actuaries Committee on Post-Retirement Needs and Risks. She will compare findings from interviews with long-term retirees and their families on how they have coped with managing their finances during the first decade and a half of retirement, including adjusting to financial shocks along the way. Please uh, use the uh, computer uh, screen section with uh, the Q&A to ask your questions and we will record them along the way, uh, but we will reserve time at the end to answer the questions so we can get through both presentations. And with that, I will turn it over to Sudipto. Okay. Thanks, Lori, and thanks everyone for attending the webinar. Um, so I'm glad that this research has generated a lot of interest and quite a bit of discussion. So I have received some great feedback from probably many people who are in attendance today. So I thank everyone for that. And with that, let me move to the slide. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so as Lori mentioned uh, uh, in her remarks that um, most of the retirement models and the advice that's uh, given to retirees uh, are based on the life cycle hypothesis, uh, which, um, to simplify, it says that people build up their savings during their working years and spend those savings uh, during their retirement years. Now, there has been some work done in the past uh, which questions uh, at least the, the saving in retirement part of the hypothesis. And most recently, the Society of Actuaries did a couple of focus group studies, which uh, I think Anna will speak to. And then there was also a 2015 uh, study by Jim Poterba and um, his co-authors at the um, National Bureau of Economic Research. And so they looked at the last two decades of, of life of retirees. So they used the same data source as I did. And they concluded that for most individuals, asset levels really did not change much during the last two decades of their lives. So we had some anecdotal evidence and also some statistical evidence uh, which challenges the assumptions that retirees spend down their savings um, 
in their retirement years. Now, in this particular study, uh, we did something very similar to what uh, Jim Poterba and um, uh, his co-authors did, but instead of looking at the last two decades of retirement, we focused on the first two decades right after retirement and how they spend on their assets during those years. Now, <clears throat> we also divided uh, our sample into three different uh, asset groups. And so when I say asset, we are looking at only at non-housing assets. So uh, the first group that we had was uh, people who had less than $200,000 in uh, non-housing assets right before retirement. And so this group is uh, the, it's in the majority of the sample. So about 68% of the entire sample was the, in the lowest asset group. And then we had uh, the next group, which is uh, retirees who had between two hundred and five hundred thousand dollars in non-housing assets, and finally uh, the highest um, uh, asset group who had more than five hundred thousand dollars in uh, non-housing assets. So, as I said, the first group, almost sixty-eight percent of the entire sample, and the rest of the sample was kind of evenly divided between the two higher asset groups. And the one thing I want to mention uh, right now is that um, in non-housing assets, the only major component which was not included are the 401k assets, which are still in an employer's uh, plan, right? So these are, everyone is retired. So if they had rolled over uh, the money from their 401k plans into their IRAs, that is included in the analysis, but if the money is still lying in the 401ks, then that's not included. So we are definitely missing some part of their portfolio. I don't think that would change uh, the broad conclusions necessarily, but that's something to keep in mind. Again, just uh, to very briefly, uh, we use data from health and retirement study. Most of you are probably aware of it. It's a, a large national survey of uh, households 50 and older done by University of Michigan and it's funded by Social Security Administration and so forth. And we also used uh, some spending data from Consumption and Activities Mail Survey, which is a supplement of HRS. Okay, so going into the results. Uh, so the first slide here you see it's for the lowest asset group. And here you can see how their non-housing assets changed from pre-retirement pre uh, until about 18 years after retirement. So I'll focus on the medians, which is the red line at the bottom. So here for this group, you can see in the first two years, the median was about close to $32,000. And after 18 years, the median is at $24,000. So that's uh, about a drop of uh, nearly 25% in 18 years. The next, we go to the, the next asset uh, group, which is households who had between two hundred and five hundred thousand dollars uh, pre-retirement. So for this group, uh, the uh, the median in the first two years of retirement, it was close to three hundred and thirty-four thousand dollars, and after eighteen years, it goes down to about two hundred and forty-three thousand dollars. So in terms of percentage, that's a little over twenty-seven percent drop in the, in the median assets over 18 years of retirement. And finally, if we look at the highest asset group, which is households who had more than uh, $500,000 in non-housing assets. So for this group, the starting median in the first two years of retirement was a little over $857,000. And after 20 years of retirement, the median went down to about $756,000. So in terms of percentage, that's little less than 12%. So in the first two decades of their retirement, uh, the highest asset group, they just spend down about 12% of their assets. So that's, uh, I would say, which is pretty slow in terms of decumulation rates. Okay, so the, the immediate question that comes to mind then, uh, does this result mean that no one is running out of money in retirement? And to answer to that is no. There is a significant number of households who do run out of money or have very little money left after the first two decades of their retirement. 
but we also see that there is a significant number of households who have increased their assets during this period. So to look into that, we had to go a little beyond the median, mean and the medians. So that's what you will see in the next three slides. Okay, so this slide is pretty busy, so I will uh, go a little slowly over um, the slide to explain what's happening here. So broadly, so this slide uh, tells us what percentage of retirees in this asset group, so we are looking at the lowest asset group, less than $200,000 in non-housing assets. So what percentage of retirees in this asset group had what percentage of their starting assets left at different points uh, in retirement? So I'll pick one example, one line from here uh, so that I can make it clear. So if you look at the blue line, which is, uh, I think, the second from the top, which starts at around 20%, so that's the line which says um, the percentage of retirees who had less than 20% of their starting assets, so the assets they had in the first two years of retirement. So, so they had, so the blue line is, the percentage of retirees who had less than 20% of their starting assets left at different points. So if you look at the first three to four year mark, the blue line is at 20%, so which means about 20% in this asset group had only 20% of their starting assets left after three or four years of retirement. And if we move all the way to the right, following the blue line, so after 17 to 18 years, that's about 35.1%. So 35% in this lowest asset group had uh, less than 20% of their starting assets left uh, after 18 years of retirement. Now, if you remember that, <coughs> sorry, so this group is the majority, so about 68% of the entire sample. So 35% of that, it turns out about nearly 20% uh, of the entire sample, so about one in five of the entire sample so they had less than 20%. And so for this group, the starting median was about $31,000. So very little assets left for a lot of people at the end of this period. But then on the other side, if you look at the line at the top, which I don't know, the color is probably aqua blue. So that gives the, uh, the percentage of retirees in this group who had more than 100% uh, of their starting assets left. So uh, after three to four years of retirement, that's a little over 40% in this group who had a more than they had in the first two years. If we go all the way to the right, after 17 to 18 years, that number is also about 35%. So 35% in this group, over the 18 years of retirement, they had actually increased their assets. So that's uh, the, the, the first group with the lowest, uh, the lowest asset group. Now, if we move to the next group, so I will go a little uh, uh, <clears throat> quickly over these, the next two slides. So, so this one is about the second asset group uh, who had uh, assets between two hundred and five hundred thousand dollars and $500,000. So in this group, we see that after 18 years, about 15.7%, they had less than 20% of their starting assets left. Now this group had much higher starting assets than the earlier group. Uh, but we also see, if we look at the line at the top, the aqua blue line, so here also we see that after 18 years, 36%, so uh, again more than one in three, had uh, more than 100% of their starting assets left in this group. And then if we move to the, the final group, uh, which is uh, the group who had more than $200,000, uh, sorry, $500,000 in non-housing assets. So in this group, after 18 years of retirement, about 12% had less than 20% of their assets left. So, um, but again, if we look at the, the, the top line, which is the, the aqua blue line, again, 35%, 35.5% in this group also, had increased their assets. So irrespective of the asset level, so we saw in all three groups, at least one in three uh, households had more than um, uh, uh, their starting assets after 18 years of retirement. So they had grown their assets, it's about one third. 
Okay. So the, the next we look at um, uh, is how does these results look for people who had pension and who did not have pensions. So the, going into this, my hypothesis was because people who have pensions, um, so they are at much lower risk of running out of money because they have guaranteed income for life. So they are probably more likely to spend down their assets. But uh, the results show kind of the exact opposite. So here you can see the, the red line is for people who had pension, how their median assets changed. And the blue line is for people who did not have any pension and how their median assets changed. So the first thing we see that people who had pensions also had much higher starting assets. But if you look at the, the line, it's almost flat. And if we compare the assets after 18 years to what they had in the first two years of retirement, it's just about a 4% drop in their non-housing assets. So people who had pensions have spent almost nothing, right? So that kind of um, made me think, so that is the, whether people are just spending their income. And because um, the, the households who have a pension income, so they have much higher level of um, regular income, which I uh, which consists of social security, pensions, or annuity, or any income generated by the assets. So whether people are just spending that income and um, uh, avoiding to touch their assets or their savings. So to look more into that, uh, so I compared their income and their spending. So here we are looking at income which, is, uh, which does not include any withdrawals from the tax advantage accounts. So no withdrawals from IRAs, no withdrawals from uh, 401k. So it's only every, everything else. So if the social security, annuity, pension, if they have income from any other sources, part-time work or income, capital income, anything, that's all included in, in income here. And we uh, compare that with their spending and if you look at the ratio of the spending to income for all the different age groups, it hovers pretty much closely uh, around one. So which tells us that um, they are basically, the so majority of the households are basically spending what uh, their income is. And that also kind of explains that uh, what we see in terms of the assets uh, remaining flat. Okay. Um, so, uh, the, the immediate question that comes to mind is uh, what, uh, why are households not spending down their assets? So that's a question we really don't uh, go deep into in this study, uh, but we offer some possible reasons. Uh, so uh, for example, um, there could be uh, just uh, some behavioral impediments. So people who have built up their savings habits over their, throughout their working lives, they find it difficult to change those habits overnight and uh, start spending their assets. And there also could be um, bequest motives. They want to pass it on uh, to their heirs. There are always uh, the, the uh, risks, uh, one of which is, of course, the uh, unanticipated risk of medical expenditures at the end of their life. And, and so forth. So there could be many reasons for that, but we don't go into uh, deep into that in this study. So what I will follow up very quickly is um, on the, uh, the, the one of the risks that I mentioned, which is the out-of-pocket uh, uh, risk for medical expenditure. So again, uh, using the same data source uh, here, we looked at a slightly different sample of retirees. So here we are looking at a group uh, who were um, 70 years old, and we follow them from uh, uh, 70 years old until their death. And so we see how much they spend on out-of-pocket um, medical expenses. So you, you might have seen uh, similar numbers or similar studies, but uh, this is uh, diff a couple of things to keep in mind how this is different. So first of all, the numbers you will see are only out-of-pocket expenses, which does not include uh, any insurance premiums. So that's a key difference from most of the studies that you will see. And also, uh, so here we are not simulating uh, the numbers for uh, hypothetical retirees. So these are 
uh, actual survey respondents and the actual uh, dollars that they reported in the survey about what they spent. Okay. So going very quickly, I'll uh, gloss over the, the sample. So we had about uh, 6,600 people in the sample uh, that we looked at. And here you can see uh, all the uh, uh, the medical services that were included uh, in it. So one thing I would mention, as, as I said, health insurance premiums are not included, and we also did not have data on over-the-counter medicines. And final thing is that uh, it is adjusted for medical inflation because we are looking over a 20-year period, uh, more than about 20-year period. So, uh, yeah, we adjusted for that. Okay, so very quickly, the results. So this number here gives us... Uh, 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 by age of death, so on the left we have the ages uh, of death and how much uh, the spending were. So if we look at the median numbers and if we go down to the, the bottom row, which is uh, individuals who died after the age of 95, so that the long lived, so for them the median was a little over $27,000. So that's not really a very high amount. So for majority of people, the out-of-pocket expenses were not really high. But if you look at the the, uh, the 90th percentiles or the 95th percentiles, there you will see that the numbers are really, really high. So the 90th percentile is close to $172,000. The 95th percentile is about $269,000. So which tells us that the risk is really concentrated at the top. Okay. And very quickly, so about 46% um, uh, uh, in the sample uh, had entered a nursing home after the age of 70, and only 23% in the sample said that they uh, incurred an out-of-pocket expense for their nursing home uh, entry. And finally, there are some big differences between men and women. So we see that uh, about 38% of men reported entering into a nursing home compared to almost 51% of women uh, who said they entered a nursing home after the age of 70. And these, these numbers tell you the, just the out-of-pocket nursing home expenses. Again, the medians are zero, which means at the median, irrespective of the age of death, uh, no one incurred. Uh, the median household, the median individual did not incur any nursing home expenses. But again, if we look at the 90th and 95th percentiles, the numbers are very high. And finally, just uh, again, this is uh, the difference between men and women in terms of nursing home expenses. Again, I will uh, focus just on one line, the bottom row, which is 95 and uh, above the individuals who live that long. So if you look at the 90th percentiles or the 95th percentiles, you will see there are a considerable difference between men and women. So women uh, are, at a, if they live longer, which they are likely to, uh, so they are at, at a higher risk of spending more. Um, so yeah, so with that, I will. Uh, I, that that's all. And whatever questions you have at the end, I'll answer them. And with that, I'll pass it to Anna. Yeah, and thanks, Sudipto. I do want to remind everyone as well to go ahead and uh, enter your questions into the Q and A box, and we will be sure to um, answer them at the end or uh, follow up with you afterwards. So, uh, thank you all, and it's Anna Rappaport. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to present Society of Actuaries Research and to um, share with you some of the results of our research. The um, big difference between our research and the EBRI research is that our research provides a human face to the results described in the data analysis. Uh, what was very exciting to us is that, by and large, the results were compatible. That is, we could understand the findings from the EBRI research, and they in light of the findings that we were finding from the interviews. Uh, the Society of Actuaries has been doing research with regard to public knowledge and attitudes on post-retirement risk for about 20 years, trying to understand and improve post-retirement risk management. The uh, 2017 segment of the research focuses on retirees age 85 and older, and it included 
some in-depth interviews and two surveys. It builds on 2013 focus groups with people retired less than 10 years and 2015 focus groups with people retired 15 years or more. And the good news is that what we see as people track through retirement makes sense. It's logically related. Uh, the uh, focus groups also link to a series of surveys of pre-retirees and retirees which have been conducted every two years since 2001. And therefore, we've got this 20 years of work. And I'm going to share with you some general findings from that 20 years of work. Again, we found pretty consistent results over the long run. The top risk concerns, and this is survey after survey, the particular con order changes, but we hear the top risk concerns being health care costs, long-term care costs, and dealing with inflation. And pre-retirees consistently have been more concerned than retirees about risks. And also, as people move through retirement, they seem more concerned about the risks earlier in retirement than in the later stages. So they gradually seem to be becoming used to things. Um, Spending other than medical costs has tended to decline with increasing age. We see major differences in situation by income level, and we're not going to share that data today, but data can be, a debt can be problematical. Uh, retirees are resilient, and many deal with the situation in a way that works out for them, but I think part of what you see in SIPTO's results is the impact of this resilience. The households are often planning for shorter-term cash flows and not the longer term. And in our research, we are asking people what they do, and we hear at all stages of retirement this focus on short-term cash flow planning and adjusting expenses. Um, the main methods of dealing with risk are adjusting expenses um, and saving more, managing debt not using financial products. Um, and households don't often plan well for risk, but they say, we'll deal with it when it happens, but also they try to retain their assets and minimize their spend down. Uh, and this has worked out well, but not in the event of some things such as divorce during retirement, major long-term care events, children needing major help over a long term. Uh, people don't plan well for major long-term care and assisted living, those tales that, Sudis that Sudis Sudipto showed you. And health status is also really important in what happens to people. So the, the late in life studies, the over age 85, the in-depth interviews, we did a little over 60 interviews working with Greenwald, uh, Matthew Greenwald and Associates, split between the U.S. and Canada. Uh, and we had a mix of people in those ages, their children, their adult children, and some interviews where we interviewed the pair. Now, all of our respondents in this and the earlier focus groups that have under 400000 in assets so that we don't have high net worth people. We try to have people who have concerns about their money. Uh, we also wanted them to not have pension income beyond uh, 2500 a month, so they'd be more like future people. The qualitative, uh, the quantitative surveys, the one survey was of people over age 85 by telephone, and the second was of adult children of people uh, over age 85 online. And we note that the first group is healthier because they could answer the telephone survey. And the second group is probably less healthy because they are, children knew about them and they were probably getting help from children. So we should keep that in mind. So our survey results, um, most of the elderly spend less than their income. We have the split between those with 50,000 of assets or more than 50,000. In the less than 50,000 group, 47% said they spent a little less um, then their income in 14%, a lot less, and even more for those with the 50,000 and over 
assets, 49% and 24%. Uh, we have quotes from the interviews, and I'd encourage you to look at the interview reports and the earlier focus group reports because we have many quotes, and the quotes by themselves may not be that meaningful, but when you see things like the data from Ebre, and then you have these quotes to go with them, it's like it, it just makes it seem more alive. Most adapt to their financial circumstances and are resilient. We have everything we need. Everything is paid for. Our house is paid for. The cars are paid for. Our kids are okay. Um, a second quote, I get a pension that's satisfactorily. Mostly I can afford everything I need. I don't need that much because I live with my children. I'm very satisfied with what I have. And that second quote's from a woman with under $50,000 uh, in assets. Uh, most are comfortable with frugality, and some even remember that they had parents living through the Great Depression. I've been somewhat frugal, because when you're a child in the Depression days, my parents were frugal. I saw how it happened for them. They were all right when they did retire. Now, one of the things we looked at in our surveys was what did people say about their spending 85, at age 85 and over compared to 10 years ago? And this is different from the work Sudipto did and Ibri because they had data. We didn't have data. We had people's recollections. So this is what they're saying, and that's really, um, really different. Um, the uh, health care spending is up. Of the elderly surveyed, 37% said they're spending more on health care now than 10 years ago versus 18% less. In the other sample, which is a less well sample, the children said 54% of their parents were spending more on health care now compared to 10 years ago, and practically no one less. With regard to paying for assistance in daily life, not much change reported by the telephone survey but the children report a big increase with 47% spending more versus 13% less. Housing didn't change much over the 10 years, so they didn't report much change. Entertainment and travel were reported radical changes. Only 10% of the elderly said they were spending more on entertainment versus 60% less. Travel, 6% of the elderly said they're spending more versus 74% less. And the retirees reported that they're frugal. Now, we also asked some questions to, uh, about what spending was, um, had a major or minor impact, was important to them. And this was asked of both the retirees and their children and asked about the last five years. And in the children's survey, the period five to 20 years ago, and medical expenses came up as important. Uh, in all of them, more so again in the, the children, uh, but that was the biggest item. For needing, uh, assi needing assisted living, only 23% of those in the uh, survey of elderly, but needing assisted living or help at home, 61% of the children said yes. About a third reported impact of the death of a spouse over the last five years but over half be the period from five to 20 years. Uh, adult children in need of financial support, uh, a little less than one in four of the people 85 and over, but that had surfaced as a major issue in the shocks work that we did with the 15 year and over retirees. Uh, giving gifts to grandchildren, um, about 41% said it had a major and minor impact in the last five years. Um, I have a little bit more data here on the things that particularly were uh, on some things, including the things that we reported as shocks in the 2015 focus groups. And two things that came up in the 2015 focus groups as shocks uh, were dental expenses and, re and home repairs. Um, of the people 85 and over, 40% said dental expenses that had a major or minor impact in the last five years. Presumably the rest they had not. A little under half on home or condo repairs 
um, in that survey. And then the, the survey of the children, about 30, a third reported that um, about a, uh, a third reported that there was less impact. Uh, so in, in the um, other thing that was really interesting is that regular monthly bills came up as a pretty big issue of the 85 and over group. Half of the children reported that as significant. Uh, we didn't have a, quite the same question for the retirees, but um, we had a, about a third increases in real estate taxes. And our next finding is that even the older people with low asset levels tend to feel somewhat secure financially. And that, um, that turned out to be a really interesting thing is how secure people felt. Those with less than 50,000 of assets, 27% said they felt very secure, 47% said somewhat secure, and 53% of those with 50,000 or more in assets felt very secure, and 37% uh, somewhat secure. We again think this is primarily shorter term thinking. Um, in our research, we found that a small level of assets seem to provide a cushion because of the way people are managing their money. And we found that in various quotes, I'm just going to share one with you. Some of it's going to funeral expenses and then whatever we have. We probably got twenty or $25,000. It's a little more than it was five years ago. It went up because she doesn't take it out. Um, Another thing that we found is that very few of the elderly are getting financial support from the family in these two surveys, but many, many of them are getting help with a wide variety of regular activities or tasks. Now, this is a survey of the elderly, and then we'll have the survey of the children data on support in just a moment. Most of the older people need help with some kind of regular activities. And this question, do you need help with any of the followings of the people 85 and older, uh, split by the under 50,000, over 50,000 asset level? Those with lower assets seem to need quite a bit more help. A third of them say they don't need help, and 45% of those with the higher assets. So of the lower asset group, 55% said they need to be driven places. About a third need help taking care of their home. Um, about 40% need help with some shopping. Uh, but only of this group, only 11% said of the lower asset groups that they need assistance with the activities of daily living, and 2% of the higher asset group. And you see that they are quite different from the group that need more help because, again, they're the people that can answer a telephone survey. Now, over three in five of the adult children said their elderly parents need help with transportation, shopping, and other things. And we have here um, a variety of different kinds of help and different methods of paying for the help and whether it's coming from, uh, whether the payments are coming from um, outside, paid for help from outside sources versus the family. Uh, so the first column are family, second column is friends, and then we've got uh, paid help right after that. And that's, um, that's just interesting in terms of the marketplace. Some kinds of help are much more likely to be bought in the marketplace. Um, And we've got um, the um, transportation, 62% are getting help from the family, 16% are getting paid help, shopping, 60, and friends is pretty small, 61 and 11. Management of medications and medical care, 44% help from the family. General upkeep and cleaning of their residences, 40% uh, from the um, family and 38% uh, 
uh, and 38% paid help. Preparing meals is also pretty high on the paid help. Um, the cost of long-term care is a major challenge. That surfaced in our work. It surfaced in Sudipto's work for some people. It's for the people that have significant. Um, it, in the interviews where we did the Canada and the U.S., it seemed to be less so in Canada because the system's a little different. But we have a quote, if I needed long-term care, I really don't know what I would do. I have wonderful children, and I know they would help me out if I needed. We see a lot of denial about this. So our conclusions and some of the lessons we've learned from retirees, uh, most adapt to their financial circumstances, and uh, they are pretty resilient. They're comfortable being frugal. We saw this in both the 15-year-plus research and the 85 and over research. We see this month-to-month -month balancing of income and expenses, which is the same thing Ebre reported. And under that circumstances, a small level of assets seem to provide a cushion. Um, most jocks seem to be less of a concern for the 85 and over than they were for the 15-year-plus retirees. And I know, we don't know exactly why, but I think maybe people are thinking about different things. and. They just have a different focus at sometimes when they get really older. Health expenses seem to be covered quite well with Medicare and a supplement, and that's exactly what Sedipto found. Um, health and vitality vary tremendously, um, and that makes a big difference. Family support becomes important as health declines, and the cost of a big assisted living or major <coughs> long-term care event would be a major challenge. <coughs> Our conclusions are further that the standards of living are sustainable in the short run for most. And they've figured out how to deal with the short-term cash flow. Um, they're very dependent on health and vitality, but there's a big threat from a long-term care event. And um, of course, Medicaid is a system of last resort, and also a big threat if they need significant assisted living, paid assisted living. Uh, people really want to have long-term care at home, but if they need major long-term care, it frequently will not work out that way. Uh, families are increasingly important, not provided for in planning, and it's important to provide for them in planning. And uh, these findings are all pretty compatible. We find resilience in all of the retiree groups. All the retiree groups have cut expenses. They tend to be frugal, except reduced spending. And it's unclear that to what extent the fact that they don't do more formal planning has hurt them. Um, as mentioned earlier, long-term retirees are overall less concerned than early retirees or shorter-term retirees. Um, when limitations emerge, things change, and families come in, but we're not planning for that, and that's an issue we're going to be working on. Long-term care is a big risk, and we think about dreams versus reality. The dream that often doesn't work out if you have a big problem is staying at home. Uh, postscript I'd like to add to this is that it's unclear if future retirees will be similar to today's. We, we have the issue of cohort versus age effects and the fact that these people grew up in the Depression fewer DB benefits, potentially reductions in Social Security and other programs, longer lifespans, and fewer children for many families going forward. We just don't know, and we'll be doing more research and assure that Avery will and others as well. And I'm going to turn it back to Lori for questions. Terrific. Thank you, Anna. Um, there is a lot of terrific content here. And we did get a lot of questions. I just want to uh, take one minute to uh, do some conclusions first in terms of overall. You know, again, actuaries, advisors, plan sponsors, and financial services companies have spent a lot of time thinking about this and designing and pro promoting retirement spend-down strategies based on their assumptions, which some of the uh, analysis today, I think, really challenges. And the questions are, um, do retirees want to spend down their assets, or do they simply want to hold on to their assets? It's that question I originally posed. Uh, you know, is it the 
the money or the stuff. And we're seeing some interesting results here. Um, the other possibility is that they just have behavioral biases that are causing them to live below their means or you know, they are making mistakes, cognitive mistakes. Uh, and that all of this has profound implications for those that are seeking to help retirees uh, in terms of their educational needs, um, how to assess retirement preparedness, and products that can help people draw down their money in retirement. So let's turn to some of the questions. And uh, we got a couple of questions about the data that I want to uh, pose to Sedipto. Uh, mm -hmm. First, on his, uh, the spend down analysis, he was asked, did the groups one, two, and three, what was the composition in terms of married couples versus single people? And also, how were frozen pension plans treated in this analysis? Um, yeah, thanks, Lori. Um, so the, uh, the way the anal analysis was done, so the uh, the household was the unit that was analyzed. So a household could be single or it could be married. So we did not make that distinction. So it's just uh, the uh, households who had assets, the total household assets, which fall, uh, which fell into all those different buckets. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it could be single or married in any of the asset groups. And the, the next question was about frozen pensions. Actually, we don't have any data to, uh, in the survey to, uh, <clears throat> to distinguish which pensions uh, uh, were frozen, which um, participants had their pensions frozen. So that's something I don't think we can look into. Yep. And another question, Sudipta, related to pensions was, um, uh, the fact that you have a group uh, that uh, is, is, has a lot of pension assets in there, and going forward we assume that uh, future retirees will not benefit in that way. So um, what are the implications in terms of your analysis for future retirees and you know, that source of income? Yeah, that's really, um, I mean, a difficult question because... Um, so the, if we if we look at the behavior of the the group who had pensions, we see that so they really did not uh, spend down their assets. So which means that if they um, did not have the pensions, they will have to spend down some of their assets. Which we saw that the group which did not have pensions, we saw some drawdown in their assets. So it's more likely that in the future uh, cohorts, BART cohorts, which uh, don't have access to pensions as the earlier cohorts did, we, they will be forced to, into spending down some of their assets. But even, uh, even if you look at the group which had no pensions, um, there, are, there are some significant drawdowns, but still the lines are flat. So, um, <clears throat> so so my takeaway is that there is uh, some something's going on beyond just pension. So just uh, people uh, not willing to spend down their assets. So as long as they can. So as when we looked at the comparison of income and spending, that clearly shows that it's uh, the way they're making their spending decisions. The majority of people they are basically limiting their spending to whatever their regular income is. Now, if we take away pension from their regular income source, so then probably they will be, some of the households will be forced to uh, some drawdown. But again, I suspect that a lot of households will still minimize, uh, try to minimize that drawdown and uh, preserve their assets. Uh, Laurie, can I jump in? There's a study from the uh, International Longevity Center in the UK <coughs> about the UK, and there are a lot of similar issues in terms of spending down assets, and they find that people with larger assets are just as reluctant to spend them down as people with smaller assets. Uh, we also have had some conversation in the Society of Actuaries Committee that leads to, leads to a little bit of that. So there, there seems to be some mindset issues as well as economic issues. Our research also asks people about the required minimum distribution. And it's fine to send, spend that because it's required, but people don't seem to think that that's spending down their assets. Very and, we do, 
And we do have, um, uh, thank you, Anna. We do have another question about that relates to that. Um, I'll ask in a minute. Um, before we we uh, we move to that, I did have one more question about the data, Sudipto, for you. How much of the decline um, in assets that you saw is it attributable to distributions versus um, how much would be accounted for in terms of change, or you know, the changes would be attributable in terms of the market changes in value? So in other um, words, does is, is your analysis take into a, uh, does it adjust for market changes? No. Um, uh, <clears throat> so uh, the way we look at it is um, if they had, um, um, yeah, I mean, the 20-year the, the peers that we studied, the, the market returns had been generally pretty good, and that's probably one of the reasons that a lot of people has been able to maintain their assets. So the, the way study is done is uh, anything that people uh, take out from their assets, we count that as income. So whatever is left uh, in, in those accounts uh, after two years or four years or six years, we look at that and how that has changed. Now that could, so both market returns and distributions could be part of it, a part of the change, but we are just looking at the end balance uh, after two years. So they might have taken out some of it and maybe the markets have gone up, so the end balance, that's why it looks that the end balance has probably gone up, even when they have made some distributions. And yeah, we, we don't, um, distinguish between those two. We just look at the final account balance. And, and I, I thought I saw in some of the back and forth uh, among the retiree actuaries group that there was some discussion of how people think about market gains and the fact that that's, uh, you're, they're more willing to spend that money um, because they, they almost view it as, uh, uh, you know, as, as more, uh, you know, the, the house money is the money that, that is the baseline and, and any market gains they're willing to spend. I think that's true for some people. I don't think we explicitly explored that in the research that we did in the focus group, but specifically that question. I'm, I don't recall exploring that, but I think that's exactly right because people would, they, if they have left what they started with, I think they're okay about it. The oh, uh, other thing in that is that, uh, for, unfortunately, some of the people really don't have skills to understand about compound interest and deal with uh, and deal with investment returns in thinking about things um, in a good mathematical way. There are a lot of people that have trouble with that. And then um, the other question we got was um, around um, kind of exploring. What uh, more about this human side of retirement spending, um, and and getting at the idea uh, that I alluded to earlier, which is, is it simply that uh, it could be viewed, I guess, one of two ways? Is it simply that people just prefer to have a nest egg because it makes them feel happier? Um, they, you know, they they it, it it gives them a sense of satisfaction that spending the money couldn't give them, or perhaps it's more uh, getting at Sudipto's analysis. They just fear that 90th and 95th percentile event so much that um, they, they uh, would rather preserve their assets out of, out of fear of that? I think it's a combination of both of those. I, or maybe not that direct fear of the event, but I'm going to hold on to my assets. I don't know what's going to happen, but if something happens, I'll, I'll have the assets. But I think having the assets also makes them really feel good. I also think the way people feel about stuff changes and they start to go through or they've been through some downsizing and the idea of having more stuff is not a positive for some of them. They, they want to have less stuff and they, I, um, I, am a pre, I am a faced retiree myself and I spend a lot of my time around a lot of retirees and uh, they're they're more in the shedding stuff, keeping stuff under control than getting new stuff. Very different from a lot of younger people. And then this, this uh, final question is really uh, about kind of more of the practical side of things. So, you know, putting on your, your uh, the, the, the hat of someone who is thinking about products and services for these individuals. 
um, what might be um, uh, what might employers or other providers be thinking about given these results in terms of helping people uh, draw down their assets in retirement? And I'll open it up to both Sue Dipto and Anna to, to answer that one. Well, I would want to start by saying that uh, a key thing that is very disturbing to me and to an, I think a number of the other people that have worked with CSOA research is um, the time horizon issue. The fact that while people are thinking about the short term, they don't really think about uh, the long term very well. And something employers could certainly do is help people to focus more on the long term. I'd also mention that the Actuary's Longevity Illustrator is available uh, free of charge and that it can be used by, if employers want to tell people, if you're interested in estimating your longevity based on your circumstances, here's something from an unbiased source that can help you do that. I think also that for the employers that offer plans, and I really think employer plans are important, they, in spite of the way people are thinking about these things, they can encourage longer-term thinking. Uh, they can provide them some tools for planning. They can offer them some options, including leaving uh, money in the plan uh, and attract, for those that want to buy an annuity, an attractive way to buy an annuity um, through some kind of a purchasing platform with institutional pricing. They can offer a range of income options, annuity installment payments, and fixed percentages. But I think I'm, I go to the, oh, the other thing I think employers can do is they can be working while people are younger to build mindset. And that if employers are illustrating income from some of this money, the plan, as people are working year by year by year, they, people might start to think about DC plans in the framework that at least part of this money is here to pr replace my paycheck and produce income. So those are all some things that, that I think people can do. Uh, I have an article coming later this year in Benefits Quarterly that covers some of this. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think so, there, so. right now I think there is a lot of emphasis in the retirement plans on retirement income and I think that the data, the research that we presented here really underscores the need for that, uh, that people, a lot of people are having problems in terms of converting their uh, the assets into a stream of income. So. Probably there needs to be a combination of uh, education and some um, product innovation or guidelines, whatever it is. So this one thing I would say about uh, annuities is that um, so annuities, um, people probably, because most people are short-sighted, they undervalue the importance of annuities, and that's why in the, all the research uh, that's out there we have seen, uh, people don't really like to buy annuity, mostly because they are uh, jittery about uh, giving up uh, the money up front. So probably we'll have to look uh, into other products which um, which, address, which can uh, <coughs> address uh, the, the conversion of these assets into a stream of income. And uh, the other thing is that I would say a lot of people, when they're planning on their own, they're probably uh, overweight some of the risks. So as, I, as we have shown in the medical expenditure data, so the, the, there, there is a tail risk, but it's for a very, very small number of people, right? And most people looking at the data probably are looking at just that and thinking that, so I need to uh, <coughs> uh, plan for that. So if everyone is planning for that 90th percent or 95th percent, so that means that um, we are overweighting, I mean, on a whole, we are definitely overweighting the risk. So there needs to be some mechanism to, uh, to address to that. Thank you. Terrific. We do have a few more questions, but we have run out of time. And uh, we will get to those questions afterwards. We will follow up with you. But thank you, Sudipto, and thank you, Anna. Um, like Anna said, um, the Society of Actuaries is doing. EBRI is also going to continue to work on these topics because they are so timely and topical. And we appreciate everyone joining us today. There will be 
um, a uh, follow-up email with replay and uh, information and information on how to obtain the presentation. But uh, with that, we'll conclude. And thank you very much for joining us. Thank we you, appreciate Lloyd. it. Everyone have a great afternoon.